glad that's such a great outcome. I will call the meeting to order. Please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First item on the agenda is approval or revision of the agenda for this evening. Is there a motion to approve the agenda? Thank you, Rebecca, and a second from Daryl. Any discussion? All those in favor, please indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? All right, next we'll move on to item 1.04. We have some wonderful recognitions for this evening. This evening, the Board of Education is pleased to recognize a number of special people who make our district a very wonderful place to be. We will be recognizing Board of Education members, staff, students, and volunteers. As we call your name, please come forward to accept your certificate. The Board of Education is pleased to recognize Hannah Fagel. <laughs> Hannah served as a student board member for this year. Her contributions this year have demonstrated the excellence of our student body. Ms. Fagel presented the student perspective to the Board of Education on a variety of issues from mental health to homework. We thank you for your service, Hannah. Mr. Mark Fislowski. <laughs> you didn't think we were going to let you go without giving you all something, did you? <laughs> Mark has served on the Board of Education for three years. He elected to not run again this year, although we tried very hard to talk him into it. 
He has acted as chair of the board's finance committee, as well as serving on the board's audit committee and facilities committee. Additionally, he has served as board representative on the district's safety committee. On behalf of a grateful community, thank you for your service, Mark. We appreciate it. <laughs> Uh, Ms. Romano is not, or Mrs. Romano is not here this evening, but um, she has served on the Board of Education since 2001. Her service included serving as board president of the board for three years and vice president of the board for one year, as well as chairing the policy committee. In addition, Mrs. Romano has served on the board's facilities committee, policy committee, audit committee, and DEI committee. Mrs. Romano's 21 years of service will have a lasting impact on our school community. Um, Sandy Rufo, our Director of Area 4 for New York State School Boards Association, is here to recognize our departing board members. Sandy? If Mark could come up. Um, it really is such a pleasure to be here at Fayetteville Manly. It seems like it's been forever since we've been able to actually see people. But um, I know Mark has made contributions in his three years. Anytime you can serve on a school board, it is a wonderful, wonderful uh, thing for our community. And certainly with your business and budgeting background, I'm sure you were very helpful to the board. And uh, we just want to thank you on behalf of the School Boards Association for your service. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Appreciate it. Thank you. And we do have a plaque for Elena. Um, if you can serve 21 years on a school board, um, it says a lot for you. Not only did she serve, it's one thing to serve, but it's another thing to be involved and to be active, and certainly in her leadership roles that she was in, as well as her volunteer activities and the many uh, other services that she provided in the school board. Um, this plaque says that the New York State School Boards Association presented to Elena A. Romano in recognition of 21 years of service and leadership to the students of the Fayetteville Manlius Central School District, June 13, 2022. And it's my honor to be able to uh, give this to someone so they can present it to her. Thank you. This year, Fayetteville Elementary was named a U.S. Department of Education Blue Ribbon School. This federal recognition demonstrates what we already know about our schools. The FM educational program is among the best in the country. Mrs. Lux, will you please come forward to accept the certificate? Congratulations to the Fayetteville faculty, staff, and teachers for your excellent work. Our bus mechanics work, work tirelessly to ensure the safety of our students while they are transported to and from school. We are very proud of our mechanics who have helped us earn a 100% inspection passing rate once again this year. John Betts. Mike Calabria, John Cunningham, <laughs> thank you very much, congratulations. Aaron Fountain. Congratulations, thank you. Pat Howley. Travis Niles. Brian Wilson. Now 
Now we're going to move on to our student recognitions. <laughs> Did we get the wrong one? Did we miss him? Oh, Bob Lapine, where are you at? <laughs> I miss you. I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> See, that's a good friend right there. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. This year's National Merit Scholar finalists from FM are Rishi Aleti, Congratulations. Kaylin Liu. Congratulations. And Erica Westfall. Congratulations, Erica. Let's give them another round of applause for that. One of our students is a winner of this year's Office for Justice Initiatives 2022 Law Day Art Contest. The winner of this contest will have art displayed by the office and their marketing materials statewide. Congratulations to Juliana Hall. The Board of Education is proud to recognize the following students who received medals in the National Scholastic Art Competition. Jennifer Dong, gold medal. You can come up if she's here. Okay. Aum Patel, a gold medal. Laura Scalzetti, a gold medal and an American Vis Visions medal. Congratulations. Anna, Va Anna Fontaine, a gold medal and a silver medal. Is it way in the back? Not here. Octavia Miller, a silver medal. Congratulations to Isabel Sullivan for her Class A Cross Country State Championship. We are proud of you for your athletic performance. This year, two teams of rowers won a state championship. Congratulations to the members of the Girls Junior 8 Plus team. Rebecca Beasley, Mary Kate Coughlin, Ava Dardis, Annie Dodger, Mary Feck, Benedita, Benedita Figueroa, and Jillian Hack.
Excuse me, there was a second page there, and we have Clara Leak and Lucy Lockwood are members of that team as well. Another congratulations to all of the girls, Junior 8 plus team. We are also pleased to recognize the girls varsity 4 plus team, Megan Elliott, Evie Holder, Grace Metnick, Margaret Osterhot, and Tess Schmidt. And Tess Schmidt, there you go. Congratulations once more to that Varsity 4 Plus team. The Board of Education is pleased to acknowledge our many language con contest medalists. On the National French Contests, our students earned six gold medals and 11 silver medals. On the National Latin Exam, our students earned 38 gold medals 23 silver medals, and five perfect scores. On the National Spanish exam, our students earned seven gold medals, 17 silver medals. And on the National German exam, our students earned five gold medals and 10 silver medals. Congratulations to all of the language, language department. <laughs> Annually, the Board of Education recognizes parents and community members who have served in leadership positions throughout the year. Please join me in congratulating the following. For the Eagle Hill HSA, Jody Hearn. For the Enders Road HSA, Lori Hansen. For the Fayetteville Elementary HSA, Jen Moore. For the high school HSA, Randley Palladino, which will be accepted by Vice President Christina Mosier. For the Mott Road HSA, James Piankowski and Jen Van Valkenburg. For the Wellwood HSA, Carrie Catalino. She here? <laughs> you sure it's okay? <laughs> For the FM Education Foundation, Seth Jolly. For the All Sports Booster Club, Jack Stauffer. For the, back, for the backstage backers, Beth Adler. In closing, the Board of Education is grateful to all of those recognized this evening. You are among the reasons why our district is such a special place. Thank you all for joining us.
Next on the agenda, item 1.05, public hearing for the 2022-23 Code of Conduct. Is there a motion to open the hearing? Thank you, Daryl, and a second from Rebecca. Do you have anyone who wishes to address the board in regard? Oh, sorry. All those in favor, please state aye. Aye, anyone abstaining? Does anyone wish to address the board in regards to the code of conduct? Any questions from the board? Okay. I think my only suggestion is we've talked about this at a separate meeting that perhaps this should, obviously this goes into place for the beginning of the year, but perhaps this should um, go to policy committee at the beginning of the, the new policy committee term to take a look at the sections we looked at as lacking perhaps with regard to public um, conduct on school grounds so that we can look into expanding some of the provisions of this to address that. Okay, thank you. And also the earlier comment I just forwarded to you an email from legal counsel we can add the term ammunition along with weapons in there. So legal has already given their blessing. I, my only concern, and this came up when that did come up, is, is whether we address that as live ammunition as opposed to ammunition. There's a difference. And I, I know there are some artifacts that some people have as backpack clips or necklaces or jewelry that are family related and that are not live ammunition so if we could make that distinction I would I would be okay with that that certainly is at the pleasure of the board I mean we did run the term by legal for ammunition so we can hmm. so I, I, I don't I haven't dug into that deeply it's it, it's and it's not semantics but but whether ammunition can actually be used or whether it's simply just a piece of metal right I think there's a difference between the two so I mean maybe that's something we address at a later date in greater detail okay we can add that to the agenda when it goes to policy to look at okay okay is there a motion to close the hearing Thank you, Rebecca. And a second from Kelly. Any discussion? All those in favor, state aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstain? Okay. Next on the agenda is public comment. Um, so we have uh, several folks for public comment tonight. Sorry, just getting to my list. She said it to me. <clears throat> oh, there we go. Okay, so we have Mr. Christopher McKee. Can we allow Ruthann when she'll go before me? <coughs> Ruthann. So I did email with Ruth or, um, over the weekend and we discussed our board policy and she's, we have her handouts that she's given us and we're going to, um, I believe you're, you were going to do your three minutes yeah. and read your own statement. Yeah, that's fine. Yes, thank you. Well, I'll just be reading her words. Yeah. Right, but I already discussed it with her ahead of time, Mr. McKee, okay. and, and I'm just conferring to what she agreed that she would be doing this evening. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. 
um, the school district needs to increase the wage they pay for their teaching assistants because with for-profit industries paying more and even nonprofit jobs places such as Advocates Incorporated paying higher wages for even part-time staff, the 16 to 17.50 an hour will not be enough. My current job working as a part-time direct support professional one-on-one -on -one with a young woman with a physical disability pays $18 an hour, so the district needs to rethink the wages if they want to have adequate staff for the students with disabilities and not burn out their current staff. The wage for the summer camp also needs to be increased. The special education camp counselors get paid minimum wage for Faithful Manly School District, where BOCES special education camp staff get paid $20 an hour, so I don't understand why the district thinks paying minimum wage is acceptable or even slightly okay. As the district has been focusing a significant amount on students' mental health, it is important to be aware of how they can support autistic students' mental health. A variety of studies have shown elevated risk of suicide for autistic people. According to the Suicide Prevention Resource Center, female, autistic females are eight times more likely to attempt suicide than non-autistic females, and autistic males are 1.93 times more likely to attempt suicide than non-autistic males. There are ways that teachers can support autistic students' mental health. One way is by creating an inclusive classroom environment where bullying is not tolerated, creating a quiet space in a classroom where students, for students who may need it, allowing the option to work independently rather in groups, and allowing students to spread out and work in the hallway if they need some quiet space. In high school and middle school, I had teachers who allowed any students to work in the hallway, which I really appreciated. And those little things can help improve a student's mental health because it can help prevent autistic burnout, which leads to many mental health problems. Um, and when goals are created for autistic students, it should be what is in the student's best interest, and it should not be to change the student or to make the student act in neurotypical ways when they have a neurodivergent brain. The last thing, it is important that the district actively supports, embraces, and celebrates its disabled students and make sure that the students know they are accepted for who they are because that will also help support the mental health of autistic students. And if I will say I um, have worked the summer camp, the special ed summer camp, and that's why it's so important that we focus on the wage for that. Thank you very much, Ruth Ann. Thank you for sending the materials, and thank you for your understanding in regards to um, the time limit. We appreciate it. Uh, we will definitely get back to you with some responses to your questions. Thank you for coming tonight. Mr. McKee? Um, Mr. McKee, I, she reached out to me. We had a, we had a conversation and agreement, so we're fine. Again, these are Ruth's words. Um, one very important thing to be aware of is that students with slow processing who get extended time on tests have slow processing in general. Slow processing can apply to how quickly a student can think the answer to a question. Students have slow processing may find participation grades very frustrating. Many students with slow processing are trying their best to participate by but by the time they think of the answer, another student has already answered, or if time, it's, time, it's a time game, they have run out of time. Some teachers may think students with slow processing are intentionally not participating or answering questions, but that is far from the truth. So if any teachers are listening, I really encourage you to measure participation and engagement in class in other ways because requiring a student to answer a certain amount of questions a week for participation, and if a student doesn't answer that amount of times, then they lose points as abolist practice. So it's important that teachers receive some more training about how to test support autistic students who have slow processing so that the student is not punished for the way their brain works. When special education services are scheduled, they need to be scheduled in a way that students in 
the same period have similar goals for the service such as speech therapy. It is important that the students get students get the services they need is not just put at a side table for a period while the therapist works with a student with completely different needs. If the therapists are overwhelmed with the amount of students on their caseload, then the district needs to do a better job to support them or hire more staff. According to a study from Vanderbilt University, almost 25% of students who attained, <coughs> attend their IEP meetings provide little or no input during the meeting. 57.7 provide some input or, and only about 12% of students have more active role in their IEP meetings. This statistic matter because these students with disabilities need to have their voice heard and no matter the type of disability the student has, there are ways to accommodate the student in the IEP meeting so that they can be involved even if the student gets to be involved for just a few minutes if they are younger. If students feel actively involved in their IEP meeting and creating their IEP, it will help them develop more confidence, advocacy skills, and it could make being in school more positive because they are able to express their opinion and thoughts about what is working well for them and what they would like to change or need more help with. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I am going to mispronounce this name and please correct me when you come forward so that I can say it correctly. Um, is it Akar Vardar? I, wow. Oh my. Glad I did. Thank you very much. Dear Board of Education, my name is Mujahida Karwardar. I am a mother of two students at Matt Road and Anders Road Elementaries. I spent most of my late 20s and all of my 30s in New York City and upstate New York, got my master's degree, worked for Ford Foundation as a project manager, and also the yogurt company Chobanis Foundation as the director. For the past several years, I am taking a break from work life to support our older son who has autism. But when I was working at Chobani, VPs and the company lawyers lived in FM district and commuted over an hour each way. They emphasized several times on occasion that FM schools were way better than any private schools. I didn't understand what that meant until I got married and God blessed us with two children. When uh, we had to move several times across states for my husband's work when he got promoted. We had a good paying job and a comfortable lifestyle, but something never felt right. Where we lived, we were always looked down as either immigrants or Muslim immigrants. Even though our family paid taxes just like any other Americans and looked just like an average American family in physical appearances, we experienced silent hostility. We moved three times in seven years uh, between four states. Finally, when we were in North Carolina, my husband accepted a position with a company in central New York and we moved to Manlius. It felt like as if we came back home. Our neighbors, school directors, kids, teachers, our older sons, therapists, everybody was so welcoming. I felt so comfortable and I started wearing hijab because people were looking in my eyes when they were talking and not to what I was wearing. When Ramadan was nearing, I noticed that the teachers at the beginning of Ramadan and Eid on their calendars. I was also approached by one of our son's teachers to talk to the kids about Ramadan. I put out a shadow puppet show with a beautiful stage that all kids and teachers love. Everybody, including the parents, were open to learning about Ramadan and our culture. I met so many parents after the puppet show and started seeing each other as a family and having regular play dates. School teachers certainly created equally welcoming every environments for all students, just like it was mentioned in New York State Education Department's Every Student Succeed Act. Few days before Eid, I emailed teachers about our kids' absence on Monday because we were celebrating Eid. Teachers said my emails was it was expected because almost all of their Muslim students at every Eid were absent. Even though teachers and school directors made every effort to accommodate Muslim families' needs, it felt odd not to have an official school closing day. I don't know the religious demography at FM schools, but every Muslim and non-Muslim parents I spoke to had 20 to 25% Muslim, stu Muslim students in their kids' classrooms. Dear board members, I'm asking before you to 
uh, I am standing before you to ask for your support in helping Muslims celebrate their biggest holidays as a family and as a community without kids losing school days. Your guidance on this matter is greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Um, Dima? Yeah. Could you ask me? I would refer over my answer to my husband. Okay. Hi, this is uh, Dr. Dorgan Badran. I am an anesthesiologist in a local hospital, and uh, I am also a parent of four kids. Two of them are in this road, one of them going to Eagle Hall next year. Uh, we've been living here in Manlius for five years. We came from Brooklyn, New York, and I am, uh, I'm going to present to you a letter or a petition that we are going, we would like to send to the board, uh, to the Fayetteville and Manlius uh, School District Board. We are writing you as, the resi as residents of the FM School District, as parents and students. We request that the FM School District publicly acknowledge practicing Muslim students in our school system. Islam is the second largest of the three monotheistic religions in the world. New York has the third largest Muslim population percentage uh, in the U.S. Just as our school system acknowledges Christian and Jewish holidays, we request that the FM school district recognizes Muslim holidays in an equivalent manner. Muslims across the world, including all Muslims in New York, celebrate Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha which are the two most important holidays in the Islamic faith. We request that the FM school system, similar to the New York City School District, which is the largest school district in the United States, and the JD School District in Syracuse, who also recently approved such holidays to be uh, off, uh, the same way the Christian and Jewish holidays are observed in our school system. We believe that all of us, Fayetteville and Manlius residents, as one community, can demonstrate to our kids that yes, FM, a school, respects all cultures, religions, no matter who they are, where they live, where they go to school, or where they come from, by closing school on these two holidays. Board support and guidance in helping Muslims celebrate their two biggest holidays with their kids, without them being absent from school, is greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Maggie McKee. She's not here. Great. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Sada. I'm a local neurologist in the area and a father of three children who are currently enrolled in the FM school district since uh, 2016. Uh, my wife, Layla Shukri, and six of her siblings uh, attend in this school district dating back uh, since 1995. Um, in New York State, a uh, bill is being considered in Albany to add six religious holidays, including both Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha. On April 29, 2021, the education law was amended by adding a new section 2590 stating that the first day of Muslim holidays of Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha shall be school holidays in the city school district in city of New York. On May 2, 2022, Janesville Duet's Central School District was not in session to celebrate their very first ever Eid al-Fitr religious holiday in the upstate area. My children go to the same mosque as some of the children from the JD school district. Um, and it was uh, somewhat disheartening to watch how the kids from this district less than five miles away enjoyed their day off. In contrast, our kids were worried about what particular class they were missing that, that hour and um, what would they be doing in gym class or music class and what schoolwork they need to make up. Overall, it is a dilemma to be subjected between praying and celebrating the only two holidays these children have uh, throughout the year, or having to go to class because of an exam or important school test that needs to be done those days. 
No child should be subjected to that experience. Uh, this issue is, par uh, is partially controlled outside the education system. For instance, as a uh, personal experience, as a physician, I'm able to cover my Jewish and Christian colleagues during Christmas, Easter, Hanukkah, Yom Kippur, but, and, and, and luckily I'm fortunate enough to have my colleagues do the same for me. Uh, this is the beauty of diversity, which allows us all the freedom to celebrate our religion. Uh, every child should have the same ability and privilege. Uh, overall, in, in all fairness, I ask this uh, panel and, and wonderful and supportive community to please help guide us make these changes to allow practicing Muslim students to freely enjoy both Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha. Thank you for your time. Um, Dr. Sadat, yes. you, perhaps you can ask, answer a quick question for me. So this year, it's my understanding that the date of Eid changed because of the position of the moon. Now, how does that work? Is it, how far out are you able to tell the exact date Eid will take place? Um, and it is often changed like that? That's right. So we do follow the lunar calendar. Mm -hmm. And usually it is one to, to do two days off, meaning uh, JD last year were actually scheduled off on Tuesday, but within a two week notice, they in particularly notice that this is gonna be, Monday will be the holiday and especially local mosques are scheduling venues where they need um, halls and, and banquet area to schedule. So they would usually know about a, a week or two ahead of time. And now with this Google calendar, you can Google, you know, the, the Eid al-Fitr and they're pretty much exact most of the time. Okay, thank you very much for uh, that. One thing to add is Eid al-Adha actually is celebrated in the summer for the next two years. So that wouldn't even affect the school calendar. Thank you very Thank much, you. Doctor. <clears throat> Mr. White. Okay, well, I'm here about my usual topic I'm presenting on about the getting grade, uh, rate of uh, degrading grading here at Fava Manlius High School, particularly, but also district wide. Um, again, this is um, the lowest of a low-hanging fruit on this issue. Um, I'm here, I'm presenting two more pages of 26 uh, signatures from students from uh, the 2018 school year. However, I'm also presenting um, 52 signatures from students uh, from uh, collected by the sophomore class president uh, this year who in the span of a half an hour collected 52 signatures in support of um, this, uh, this ban on uh, zero and 50% grades issued for late assignments. Um, again, uh, you know, there's this, it's starting to catch on. There's gonna be more, more uh, signatures collected uh, as a result, and so I imagine we'll be back next fall to continue to progress this issue. However, this would be a good time to address it. I mean, most teachers adopt their um, plans for how they're gonna be doing their grading and their, their formulas and their algorithms or whatever they're using for doing their grading. That's a summer task, and so I'd like to ask that uh, the board act on this so that the teachers can potentially make the necessary changes to their grading um, rubric or policies for the fall. Um, again, you know, this is really the lowest of low-hanging fruit. Um, you know, and, and I can't stress enough that, you know, for a student to be given a zero grade, you know, for a uh, something that they've turned in even five minutes late, um, I mean, that is the equivalent of three Fs. It's equivalent of getting three 67% F grades. And I just don't see how that's fair for a and fraction of time, which has nothing to do with the subject in question. That's one of the things I've discovered over the past two years as I've been dealing with teachers about this particular issue. They never, it never, it's always outside of their preview of, of the subject they were hired for to teach for the district, whether it be geometry or, or um, global history or whatever. Um, the students employ this, this punitive uh, grading policy it's never, it's never about the subject that they were hired to teach. It's always about trying to teach some sort of lesson to the student. My philosophy on that is if you wanna teach moral lessons to students, um, be a coach, 
be a, a volunteer to be a to be one of the uh, faculty advisors for a club or something like that, and then you can impart all those lessons you want. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. White. Uh, Nicholas, is Nicholas here? Hi. Is it Maculay? Macaulay. Macaulay. There you go. Thank you. Um, you'll have to forgive my naivety for a little bit. This is my first, hey Jason, my first school board meeting since I was a senior in high school 23 years ago. Um, but what motivated me to go to that one when I was a senior is the same thing that motivated me to go to this one. Uh, it was almost exactly 23 years ago, the combine shooting happened. So I, I um, am a proud father of two, ages seven and four, two little girls. And my seven year old is in first grade at Immaculate Conception, but she'll be going to Fayetteville Elementary School next year, so I'm obviously thrilled to hear about the Blue Ribbon uh, Award that, that they've received. So in light of the feedback I got in the email about what this forum is for, I have a list of questions that I do want to ask somebody. I don't think it's here, but I just want your uh, feedback in terms, of, in terms of my concerns or questions basically that I have that I'd like to address to somebody. I'm assuming the superintendent of schools regarding school safety and security. Um, how do I go about doing that? It would have to do with school resource officers and simple security measures that the schools take. Yeah, please call my office at 315-692-1200 and we'll set up a time to get together. Wonderful. Thank you very much, sir. Yield my time. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you very much. And that concludes our public comment. Next, under President's report, we have information about the NISBA Area 4 nomination. Um, and we also have information about the OCM BOCES vacancy. Excuse me. So that's the <coughs> Luke Moranis, who represents Homer and Cortland School District. He resigned effective June 30th, 20, um, 2022. So there is going to be a nomination process um, for that seat. Um, next in rotation for that seat is Cortland. And Cortland has nominated Ms. Christine Gregory for the OCMBO seat representing Homer and Cortland. So I believe a bit later on the agenda, we will see what item that is. It's, There is no board action required. We don't need to vote on that this evening? That is correct. Okay, so those are those two openings in. The other thing I wanted to mention is on July 25th, we have a contingency meeting um, on the calendar already, but I'm hoping that everyone's available for that so we can get some retreat time in on that day. Um, and we usually do have some voting that we need to do for people who've been um, may have been hired a little bit later. So we will, um, if not able to do a retreat, we definitely will probably need to have a quick board meeting that day. So we'll get some doodles out to everyone and see how that works for everyone's um, schedule. And I did want to recognize um, Pride Month. And, um, you know, we are doing a lot of work on diversity and equity and inclusion in our district. A lot of people immediately think of, of race or um, or religion when it comes to, to um, diversity and equity and inclusion, but it definitely includes the members of our pride community. So I wanted to wish a happy pride month to our staff, teachers, and um, families who are part of that community. Next on the agenda is superintendent's report, Dr. Tice. Thank you, President Mims. Uh, the superintendent's report, the general report uh, is listed there for you. Under strategic planning and capital project updates, our strategic planning in the area of facilities continues to move forward with weekly meetings, as you know, on the design of the high school that was recently approved, our recently approved capital improvement project. As mentioned in an earlier report, the architects have submitted the schematic design to state ed, and they, along with the construction management team, are reconciling the initial cost estimates for this construction project. 
they recently submitted that uh, to the facilities committee for their consideration. The next milestone will be design development uh, step, which is a little later this month. Under UPK update, I put down 111, but I believe Ms. Evans, it was 119, as you said this morning, registrations for UPK. The lottery was held last week and 104-year-old children were selected. So we are determining right now whether or not the community-based partners will be able to accommodate the remaining children or will establish a wait list in preparation, the district hosted an organizational meeting with all the providers, along with representatives from the district office administration and transportation department in an effort to be proactive in answering questions and laying the groundwork. So a special thank you to Ms. Evans and Dr. Coughlin for setting that up and uh, Ms. Corbin, who will be the new supervisor in that area. Under DEI update, I'm pleased to report that the conversation about diversity, equity, inclusion that was generated at our recent May 17th Professional Learning Day was well received. Special thanks to our administrative cabinet, our instructional specialists and teacher leaders for helping to facilitate the conversations on that day. And then last but not least, uh, the final COVID report, COVID update and quarantine analysis. As the school year draws to a close, I'd like to call your attention to the 1,486 confirmed cases that uh, the school district had with 883 coming at the middle and high school levels and 603 at the elementary level. Since the mask mandate was lifted on March 2nd, we have witnessed 769 positive cases, more than half of the total for the entire year uh, throughout the school district with the majority coming at Wellwood at 187 and the high school with 212. Under symptomatic update, at this point in the school year, the district sent home about 1,095 students because they were symptomatic. This includes 336 students at the high school, 142 at Eagle Hill, 137 at Wellwood, 117 at Enders Road, 189 at Fayel, and 136 at Mott Road. Prior to March 2nd, we had 558 students that were sent home. Since March 2nd, we've witnessed 520 who were sent home. And then last but not least, under surveillance testing, as mentioned earlier, Onondaga County continues to collaborate with school districts on random pooled saliva uh, COVID testing for students and employees. Since the inception of this program, FM has sampled 3,174 individuals, with them about being 1,789 students and 1,385 faculty staff which is 13 reported pooled cases in the portal quadrant prior to the end of the mask mandate. The number of surveillance positives more than tripled. Uh, there have been 27 more positive cases for a total of 40 over the school year uh, since the masks have come off on March 2nd. That ends my superintendent's report. Thank you, Dr. Tice, and our newest item on the agenda, or the mental health services update. Uh, under mental health report, under tier three support update, and I'm pleased to report that our tier three community partner, Dr. Melissa Carmen, provided school officials with a proposal for additional services. The administrative cabinet reviewed the proposal as did the district office administrative team. Uh, we will adhere, need to adhere to our purchasing guidelines, and I told that to Dr. Carmen today when I spoke with her, and possibly issue an RFP to all interested and potential mental health counseling partners in our community. Certainly there are some services under the threshold limit that may allow us to move forward with staff development training, especially in the area of mental health first aid. Under family school liaison update, special thanks to Mr. Gordon and Ms. Evans for completing the interviews for the two additional family school liaisons, tier one services that were included in the budget. This will give us six family school liaisons. As you know, we've added incrementally over time for the entire district, which will include all six buildings. Certainly, the family school liaisons will be able to start their day in each of the six buildings, but they may end up moving to other buildings, much like we're doing this year in terms of servicing the need and in response to where the active caseloads take them during the academic year. 
And last but not least, mental health first aid training. I'd like to thank uh, Ms. Heidi Green and Dr. Ray Kilmer for helping to organize some student mental health first aid training for the high school students this past week during their physical education classes. The training was delivered by an educator from Contact Community Services who did an outstanding job in terms of reaching out to the students uh, this past week. So thank you to Dr. Kilmer and Ms. Green. That ends my mental health update. Any questions for Dr. Tice in either of these reports? <clears throat> Dr. Tice, you mentioned that you did attend some of that training. Could you describe it to us? Uh, I was called It's Real, and certainly uh, uh, the person, uh, Will DeSantis, as an educator, did a great job in terms of broaching the subject, engaging the students in conversation, so they weren't just sitting there on their hands. It was a fairly active conversation, and it was about an hour presentation done in 40 minutes, so leaving them more. So certainly I think there's more that we're exploring right now with contact community services as a way to continue that, but very well received by the teachers in attendance as well as the students. Yeah, I know, um, at least when I attended, it was a very active um, presentation and a lot of this, uh, my friends who I talked to enjoyed it and we were glad to have it, yeah. So my, I do have a couple of questions and whether we go through this tonight or a next meeting, I'm, I'm not quite sure, but this agenda item originated as you know two meetings ago when the students, many of the students came forth and spoke to us and, and brought the survey results. And my, my question that evening was, when are we gonna talk about the survey results that they brought to us? And I was told at the following meeting and I, I was not at our last meeting, but it wasn't discussed. So. You know, I have a lot of questions about that, and not the least of which is, I assume you've had opportunity, plenty of opportunity by now to discuss that with your administrative team. And, and I'm, I'm just very curious to know what, if anything, within that survey was surprising to the district, and if you could speak to anything specific in terms of how that was received and how it may be responded to, if at all. What I can tell you is that we want to be able to get in as far as a multi-tiered support system and to be able to do our own survey. I mean, that survey initially was through, I believe, Instagram with a friend group, and I think we need, number one, it sent a message that's powerful to involve the students, but number two, it's, it's incumbent upon us to be able to open it up to all students, not just some within a certain Instagram group. So I'm being facetious, but if there were 20 students in that group and 10 reported whatever, well, 50% of the students well said that, well, 20 students in that group, and again, I'm just doing this for purposes to illustrate, is not the entire population. So I think what we took away from that is with contact community services, and we're looking at partnering with them possibly for a coordinator going forward, it's gonna be important to engage with our own survey. It's going to be important to do uh, check-ins uh, with teachers and students. The older students can self-report at the younger levels. The teachers can update on the students, but I think it's, we realized it's not just a snapshot that was presented at the podium a couple of meetings ago, but it's being able to do it on a regular basis with periodic check-ins. So those have been the discussions that we've had over the last month. Okay, so I, I certainly appreciate those discussions are taking place. I, you know, the position that we're in is that data informs policy, right? Or in most instances, data should inform policy. And at this point, that survey is the only actual data that we have. And, and, and it was 700 students who did respond to that. So it is quite a number. And I understand how it was transmitted. Um, so I guess my, my question is, is there then a specific plan that the district will be administering a survey, and if so, when? That I don't have an answer right now, but in terms of uh, the check-ins, that's something we want to be able to start the next academic year with and go forward, and I think certainly a survey will come out of that as well. But I think we need to start to get in with the students and again, take the regular pulse. So not 
for the end of the school year, but certainly probably sometime in the autumn. Is it something that you would consider before the school year begins so that we have that data before the school year begins so that that may inform some decisions going forward? I just don't know if that's been considered at all. That's what I'm asking. We haven't talked about that in particular. Craig, as it relates to the COVID update that you gave, just for clarification for I, I, you know myself and others, um, where are we in terms of like protocols? Is everything, and I, I hate to use the term normal, right? But I guess pre-pandemic, are we back to pre-pandemic setups now in all of our buildings in terms of the cafeterias, you know, the kids, there are no seats are blocked at tables, or, or where are we with that um, in this process as we come to the academic year? And then I know three months away, you know, we'll be probably looking for more state guidance before you can tell us what next year will look like. But where are we, I guess, currently with all the buildings? In turn, if you're speaking to uh, social distancing, we return yes. to pre-pandemic levels. Certainly it's still incumbent that those who tested positive uh, wear masks on day six through 10. Uh, we're still reporting, as the board knows, I shared with you in backup information that all of that continues until June 30th. What's interesting to note is last year at this time, they said that the reporting, the surveillance tests, I mean, everything was suspended, meaning over the summer till the start of the school year. This year, the uh, New York State Department of Health said that it ends June 30th. So it's our belief, given that foreshadowing, that it isn't suspended, that uh, in the sense our reporting requirements the protocols that you're referencing will end June 30th and that there will be no reopening plan for the upcoming school year. But that's what, we'll, because it ends June 30th, not as suspended on June 30th. Now that's, that's great to hear, thank you. I won't tell you that the monkeypox testing is starting July 1, but that's a different topic. Any additional questions for Dr. Tice? Okay, we'll move on to our committee and representative updates. So I believe we had two meetings since our last, two committee meetings since our last board meeting. Um, facilities, Dan, anything to report? Yeah, I actually wanna go back in time slightly since I wasn't at our last board meeting. Um, the facility, so we had a facilities meeting on June 2nd was our most recent. I, I don't recall the date of the one prior to that, I just don't have that in front of me. I know you all have the minutes, um, but, it, but I do just want to address that prior meeting first um, because kudos to the administration and kudos to the other members of the facilities committee. Um, the primary agenda item for that meeting was a review of security protocols that have been implemented, security protocols that will be implemented, and the process for continuing to update those and evaluate our status of where we are with respect to security at our schools. So I, I just I think that speaks to FM not being a reactive district, but being a proactive district. Um, and, and so just kudos again to the fellow committee me members and, and the administration for, for doing that. That is ongoing work. That is not work that we stop doing here at this district. There were two items that were brought up at that meeting as recommendations. I don't know if they need to be acted on. I frankly would prefer that they be acted on so that they're embodied in policy. And those two recommendations were that, um, number one, that security audits be repeated on a five-year recurring uh, cycle. Last time we did that, we did two separate security audits so that we got a broader base review and set of recommendations from different perspectives. So the recommendation of the committee was that, they, was that we repeat that on a recurring five-year cycle. And the other recommendation from the committee was that uh, tabletop fire and EMS services be coordinated by the district and that those be repeated on an annual basis, especially now that we're out of the pandemic and can do those in person. So those were the two recommendations that came out of the prior meeting. Um, I, with the board's consent, I would prefer that we be able to document those as commitments of this board going forward. So I'll pause on that before I get to our most recent meeting. Anybody have any 
objections to those being the pro. The there was no argument. I'm sorry. There was no argument from the administration. The last reviews were done in autumn of 2018, which would put us on schedule for summer autumn 2023, which incidentally choreographs well with our building conditions survey. And though it's not uh, it written down, it has this been a procedure in the past that every five years or five years ish, this is done? Not been. Oh. But the security audits in the way that we did them last round had not, I don't recall when the last time before that that they were done, but it was not on a recurring fixed cycle. Iron no, uh, ironically in 2013, it was done locally by the town of Manlius Police Department. So you're right, it was different in 2018 by getting the two firms to kind of look at it from different angles. So in 2023, we could stay local, we could go back to those firms, we could hire firms we haven't even met yet uh, to be able to give us a different look on some of the analytics um, going forward. From a process perspective, would we ever consider putting a policy together to implement those schedules, or is that just giving the policy committee a lot more work? You know, I, I think in some ways, you know, we have a policy about long range facility planning, and I think it could be incorporated into that policy. I mean, it seems that if it is the will of the board to keep a consistent schedule, that to memorialize that somewhere in the policy would, would make sense. So perhaps we add that to the next policy committee, whoever's chairing that next year. And then, so then, to our most recent meeting, Dr. Tice summed that up, and that's in the minutes. Um, schematic design is done on the high school. Um, that also ties into the security audit. Obviously, the high school building is going to be changing very significantly, um, internally and externally. So design development um, is due middle of this month. I'm not quite sure how close that schedule was. Um, so you know, more detailed numbers will be coming in. Numbers are very, very preliminary at a schematic. Um, basis, but we're still on target for SED submission September or October of 22, SED review sometime between October through December of 22, and, and bidding in January of 23. Obviously, this is a tremendously difficult time to be doing cost forecasting on construction with inflation being the way that it is, the supplies being the way that they are. So the team's hard at work on that, and there are some significant um, contingency reserves that are built into their preliminary numbers and those will continue to carry through as we move through the processes of this um, that was everything else is in the minutes from that committee meeting I was uh, just texted by the Asbo Philip Frendenberg Memorial <laughs> you knew that was coming award winner uh, that it is on our RFP schedule. So it is memorialized, but we can still do it in policy. But he's passing notes again, so. <laughs> and congratulations on that very prestigious honor. <laughs> okay, uh, community relations, Rebecca. So I would say most everything is in the minutes, but just to pull out a few highlights, we had a long conversation about mental health and um, the district's working on some materials to send out to the community um, for the fall or the start of the school year and that will really break down the services that are offered in detail um, and what services are best availed for what um, needs. So, that is forthcoming um, as well as we did talk about what surveying would be done in the future and that's still being worked out, but um, it's definitely on the radar for the district to be thinking about next steps from a district-wide ongoing survey in partnership with our, our mental, you know, driven by our mental health um, service providers and our, our team here. We talked about really just making sure the community knows what we did do with DEI. I mean, the policy took us most of the year, but now that that's been passed, as, long, as well as the administrative regulations, um, we talked about just making sure that there's um, enough articles and communications from the district about what's been done, including the work that's been done internally with the administrative team and with 
um, our board around um, book studies and retreats around the DEI work. And um, on the communications plan, as you know, there's um, the team runs a very tight ship. We talked about um, there's a increased concerns around safety and security, and so we recommended making sure that that is an equal kind of fourth pillar to um, focusing on on budget um, as well as the other you know facilities and planning. So. I think you know mental health budget and safety and security um, as, as well as DEI will be a focus to make sure that um, the community is aware of all the work that has been done because a lot of that work was done at least when I started on the board is now five years ago as Mr. Seidberg was talking about so what what can we need to refresh the community on what's been done and then what we're planning for the future to help people feel that we're uh, to know what we're doing to the extent we can share those pieces. There's obviously a lot of pieces of security that can't be um, openly shared in detail, but a broad brush. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, Sherry, did you have anything at our legislative liaison? Um, I know that I had promised to have the it's, uh, some drafts for our um, resolutions that we've been talking about. Uh, when it comes to both uh, funding for the school buses and funding the veterans exemption, uh, personal reasons, I wasn't able to complete that. But the timeline is that it does need to be submitted by August 1st. And that, therefore, I'd like to discuss it at our next time we can discuss things to get that out. Like, as soon as I'm ready, I'll probably send it off to you. And then we can discuss it at the meeting. So we can get it in well before August 1st. Something that NISBA does offer is a like a helping service when we when it comes to writing resolutions so if they look at it and they say can you tweak this or this has already been proposed let's switch this if we get it in early enough they'd be able to help with that so i'm hoping that i can we can get get a move on and not just wait for the last minute but my fault that we weren't able to get it in by today can can we just flag on that um i had sent all of you a link to a bill that's pending and circulating on school start time statewide, um, which is obviously a topic that we as a district have spent considerable time and study on. And and I don't know how the rest of my board members feel or the administration. I just feel very strongly that that's a very local decision and, and not one that really is the proper purview for a statewide mandate. And it could affect things in a direction that perhaps doesn't fit for our district. So I don't know what position we as a district would take on that. I know what position I would take on that. Um, but I, I do think it's something that we should discuss and whether it's part of those resolutions, whether it's something we do directly legislatively, as far as taking a position on that, I, I think there's, I think there are issues and concerns with that coming as a, as yet another statewide mandate. Why don't we add that to our discussion? when we go over the resolutions. Okay. Uh, next on the agenda, agenda uh, Hannah. Um, <clears throat> first and foremost, I would just like to say thank you for allowing me to serve on the Board of Education uh, this school year. I greatly enjoyed it and um, it was something that I never thought I would do. And then becoming class president, it was one of um, the aspects of my role. So I really appreciate that. Um, and I know uh, the junior class president who will be taking over next year um, is excited and ready uh, for this role. Um, second, I just wanted to quickly mention that most of the students who came to the Board of Education meeting um, a couple months ago, the majority of them were senior, uh, seniors. So now that we are leaving in the next couple of days, we just ask that uh, whatever you guys are doing as a district with uh, mental health and mental health services, you continue on. And um, if it's getting out a survey or if it's starting the year off strong, um, expressing all the services we have at the high school, that would be greatly appreciated as um, 
some of your pivotal voices of FM High School are moving on to uh, new adventures next year. And then um, my last comment is just that I think most of the students at the high school are ready for summer now. It's been a, a long and tough year and it's going to be a much needed um, summer vacation. So thank you. Thank you, Hannah. And, and what's the name of the incoming, the uh, new class president? Her name or his name? Uh, yeah, her name is uh, Victoria Cavallini. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Moving on to item 2.05, special services report. Assistant Superintendent Evans will present the special services annual report. Amy. Good evening. You are not the only one that's ready for summer vacation. <laughs> I think a lot of us agree. So I'm thrilled to stand here tonight as a representative from Special Services to share all of the incredible work that our psychologists, special educators, ENL teachers, and students have accomplished this year. I'm going to highlight some of the components of Special Services tonight and share how our work has evolved as we reach, hopefully, the other side of the pandemic. So some quick numbers in review. As of June 1st, our total district enrollment is 4,137. We have 81 preschool students with disabilities, 474 school-age students with disabilities, um, which at school age, that's 11.4% um, students with disabilities. As of 2018, the statewide um, average was 12.4%, but I can imagine that after the pandemic, that's seen a great increase, but I have not seen an updated statewide average thus far. So overall, the department was in a good position to face the changes that COVID brought to us. We have highly effective teachers and staff who are committed to strong programming for our students. But our challenge was to address the needs on a larger scale and at a much faster pace than we were accustomed to in the past. It was evident very early on as we returned from hybrid and remote learning that our youngest learners needed the most support. And they had faced the greatest academic and um, social impact during the pandemic. But as I always say, and my parents always taught me, challenge always brings opportunity. So we began working on enhanced programming that would allow equity across buildings and allow students to eventually attend their home schools. So one of the challenges in special education is you always have to be about a year ahead of yourself. So annual reviews, um, which are those yearly meetings that you're mandated to hold to develop the IEP for the next year, they beginning in, in January because of the number of students. So we had to really develop that programming by November or December to get it on the IEPs for this year. So this chart highlights really the increase we've seen over the years with the greatest increase being through the pandemic. So you can see the total increase in IEPs from 27, 18 to now. We've seen a great increase in speech and OT services and probably our greatest struggle this year was the increase in referrals to CSE. So that put a lot of work in our psychologists. It pulled them away from some other work, but it's okay, because that's what our students needed. So they buckled down, they worked on those initial evaluations, and that um, really caused an increase in CSE meetings. So as of Last Friday, we had held 606 CSE meetings. Um, not all students qualified, um, but a lot of meetings, a lot of evaluations, and it really caused us to look at what kids needed. So even if they didn't qualify for special education services, we knew parents had concerns and we needed to look at things differently for our students. So some of the factors, um, that were causing these increases were there was a great increase in parent requests for initial evaluations. So a lot of concerns with, um, I hate to use the 
term interrupted learning. It was changes in learning. Kids were learning on computers. Hybrid learning was just a different way of learning. So parents were really spending a lot more time with their kids and they were seeing things through a different lens and they were referring students for attention issues, concerns with reading. We know that math tended to be a great concern during the pandemic because once you unlock that code to read, you, you can read, but math builds on itself day to day. So we had a lot of concerns around the area for math. We saw an incredible increase of referrals from teachers for attention and focus issues in the classroom. I can tell you from my own personal experience, having my own kids home, I, they didn't sit still very long and they were in and out of the chairs, so they just were learning in a different way. Uh, lack of traditional preschool experiences, not good or bad, but a lot of kids were learning on the computer for preschool. Um, just a different experience for kids. They lack those social interactions with their peers. And we still struggle with in, an insufficient number of preschool providers at the county level. And I think that's cr across counties. So although students may have been identified by the Committee on Preschool Education, and had services identified on an IEP, they may not have received the correct number of services that were indicated on that IEP. So they came to kindergarten with fewer services than they would have received. We had for, uh, not a good or bad, um, increased number of transfer students coming into the district. And because of hybrid and remote learning, I think, all school districts will tell you there was a lower declassification rate. It was really hard to have the data to say that kids no longer needed that service, even if test scores indicated that they were fine. So based on these many factors, it was imperative to immediately um, add some traditional supports, but to examine what we were doing and respond in a much different manner. Different problems, most certainly, require different solutions. So I thank you again to, for allowing us to create the Executive Director for Early Childhood and Special Education. So we are excited that this, um, that Ms. Corbin will be working with our UPK program, but we'll also be able to facilitate the new special education programs that we're going to put in place to work with our littlest learners, as I like to call them. She will support teachers and principals at the elementary level as they adjust to the ever-changing needs of our students and to continue and enhance and grow that programming. We began adding time at the K level, as I told you earlier, when we worked on the annual reviews to ensure that our incoming students have the additional support necessary to adjust to school, have access to the curriculum through accommodations and modifications, and ensure that the learning and social emotional needs are monitored by a special education teacher. So all K students receiving special education support in the past were receiving on average two hours or 120 minutes a week with a special education teacher. Beginning in September, um, students who are eligible will receive an increase and they'll receive approximately 450 to 600 minutes per week uninterrupted per week with a special education teacher that will co-teach with a general education teacher in the kindergarten classroom. At the middle school level, um, we were starting to hear a lot of concerns about writing and reading. And when we looked at um, the kids, we noticed that a lot of them from third grade on were at home and working on a computer and there wasn't a lot of handwriting and things um, traditionally happening, which is fine, it's just a different skill they um, acquired. So our traditional integrated co-teaching model, we increased that from an ELA and math block and we added social studies to add increased time for reading and writing skills with a special education teacher within the gen ed classroom. So students, um, so by adding the executive director role, we were able to enhance the role of the district psychologist along with increasing that programming. So Becky Hartman-Wade has traditionally been chairing the bulk of our meetings. She's been chairing our Committee on Preschool Special Education. Ms. Corbin will be able to take that role on and really have a handle on our learners coming in from 
UPK and our other preschool programs. That will allow Becky to quickly respond to situations in school buildings. She will be able to use her expertise in child psychology and development and behavior modification to go into schools in, a, in an urgent manner and develop behavior plans, help schools to progress monitor those plans, work on class-wide intervention plans as necessary, and to assist psychologists if we see another year of high um, referral rates in the building. So she'll be able to be dispatched to a school within 24 hours rather than waiting for an outside consultant that can take several weeks. So I'm really excited about that enhanced response for school buildings. So further, we're very close to purchasing an int intensive tier three reading program for use in the special education programs to address some of those concerns we've seen that come along with those increased services and you're gonna hear about that in the next slide. And certainly last but not least, the addition of the UPK program. So that is gonna allow us at least for 100 students to have that closer relationship with our four-year-olds to be able to be part of those classrooms, to be able to have that relationship with parents and see what levels kill children are on as they come into our classrooms in kindergarten. So I've been working throughout the year um, with consultants from the Wilson Reading Program. It's an incredible intensive intervention for students in grades two through 12, um, specifically with language-based learning disabilities. It's a very structured literacy program. And I don't know if you've ever heard of Orton Gillingham. It's been around for, I think, 100 years. Um, it's really effective for students who are dyslexic, but any language-based disability. Um, in the next few days, our special education teachers will be receiving an email with um, a a very large number of trainings that they can sign up for over the summer. It's a three-day intensive, 18-hour course. It is online, although we're reaching the other side of the pandemic, it's still online. However, it will give them the opportunity to network with special education teachers across the country. So at the end of that three-day training, they will be official, officially Wilson trained. From there, they will have the opportunity to do a one-year practicum to be level one certified, um, which would be an incredible op opportunity for them to um, further their opportunity to offer students a deeper understanding in reading, and it's they would be coached by a Wilson trainer for the entire year, work one-to-one -one with a student for the practicum, and at the end of that one year, they'd be a certified by Wilson as a trainer. Um, so more to come on that, hopefully throughout the next year. I'm very excited about that. So while all these things have been happening, we have moved into the digital age in special education. If you've been in district office, we have a lot of files. So if we can accomplish this this year, we're gonna have a whole lot more room in district office. So we have purchased the document repository um, for IEP Direct, which is essentially a digital student file. So within um, the online IEP Direct system, we are able to store all of the student in a secure manner all of the students' evaluations, prescriptions, behavior plans, all within their file. Um, most, country, uh, most districts across the country do use IEP Direct, so if a student transfers in or out, at the click of a button, we can transfer the records to the district. Until this school year, all of our CSE meeting minutes um, were printed and stored in a binder. We have worked with a front line to be able to store that within the IEP document, which has been fabulous. If a parent calls and has questions and I wasn't at the meeting, I can pull up the document, read the minutes, and it's as if I was at the meeting so I can answer their questions. We did write a grant in conjunction with the Jamesville DeWitt School District to the New York State Archives um, to hopefully secure funding to scan all of the special education records back to 1950? 1951 to present date, um, so that moving forward, everything will be in digital format and we will no longer have paper records for students. 
and we have continued the VIS contract with Dr. Shane and Boston Children's Hospital, and we have benefited greatly, continued to with a consultancy with Lisa Deneen this school year. Um, Section 504 accommodation plans are a large part of special services and similar to CSE, we saw a similar increase in referrals. We have 200 current 504 accommodation plans and we did see 79 new referrals. So we've held, I think it's 231 meetings this year for accommodation plans but we also did make those digital this year. It was a component we opened up in Frontline IEP Direct. So the same thing with 504 plans, they're digital, we can transfer among schools. But even greater than that, um, all the teachers can now see them in school tool. They have immediate access to a student's accommodation plan and they can be transferred to other districts if a student moves. So similar to our previous discussion on mental health and student needs, homebound instruction is also part of student support. We did see an increase in requests for homebound services with students returning to um, traditional school day services. And it did allow us the opportunity to get creative and work with our school counselors, psychologists, and outside provide, providers to create some unique programming for our students who were in need of homebound services. We were able to alternate programming between home services, community sites, um, hospital in some situations. We were, for kids who may have been experiencing um, some school anxiety, we were able to slowly bring the homebound tutor into the school building to try to alleviate that. Um, building really unique and personalized programs for our kids in need, and we did see a lot of success with that. We did create something, um, I like to call it Operation School, for kids who were um, able to access the traditional school environment on some days. We wanted to take advantage of that as much as we could, so we would have the tutor on call. If a child could come to school on a certain day, they did, and they were successful. And if there was a day, whether um, for mental health, medical, they couldn't, we would have that tutor available to assist the child on that day. And we also were able to utilize the BOCES remote program as needed with a note from a physician. So a lot of really unique programming happening this year. Um, we, our department took a lot of pride in creating programs to meet the need of the student instead of trying to fit the student to the program. So I'm gonna just get this a little out of order. So ENL, I think we don't always get to sing their praises. We have three wonderful ENL, English as a New Language teachers, and you can see these are just the countries that our current students in programming represent. They also speak 17 different languages. Um, so this year, we, we still use our traditional translators, the, um, but unfortunately, th that takes some preparation to get a live translator to the building. You have to book them a couple weeks in advance, but emergencies happen, or teachers wanna talk to um, a parent just because they wanna talk to a parent, or a nurse needs to an urgent you know, phone call with a parent. So we were able to contract with Language Line Solutions. Um, if you haven't heard of them, it's on-demand language access system. A lot of police forces and hospitals use them. They're accessible 24-7. We were able to get a code for every ENL teacher, every school building and district office so that at the touch, any phone, you put in your code so we know who called and what building so we can track the use. And it's incredible. You say the language, if there's a dialect, you tell them the dialect, and within, I don't think I've ever waited more than 60 seconds, there's a person that comes on the line, you conference call the parent in, and you can have an incredible conversation within one minute. So it's been wonderful this school year to be able to do that. We still, when we know we're having a CSE meeting or a planned meeting, we will still contract for 
a live translator, but a, a person to come in person, and that's been great too. So with the combination of both, we have been able to have some great conversations with our families. So I appreciate um, the opportunity to share all this wonderful work with you. I appreciate your support throughout my first year. It has been a pleasure working with everyone and, and being able to watch our students learn and grow. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Amy. Um, I was really excited to hear you mention the uh, translation service. It's really great. Um, I have lots of students who speak different languages and Google Translate just doesn't cut it. So that's just <laughs> a really good service to have, I know that. But what about our materials? Do we have them readily available for all the different languages that we know? Or in our district, or how does that work? Some of them are very challenging. Some of them we do not, we cannot get written material for. We are working with a translation, a written translation services to get some things translated. We're in the process of trying to get a transcript um, done. It's been a challenge. We're making strides. I will tell you that, but it is not perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Amy, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation and a wonderful first year. Um, I was curious, for you said there's been a, a big increase in referrals to CSE for many reasons, and also that many of those students don't qualify for special services. What is the general process for a student that fits that criteria that maybe had some increased problems due to remote learning, and but they didn't qualify? What, how do they get other supports? So um, we certainly look at tier one instruction and how they access it. Um, we use response to intervention. We have a lot of um, fabulous reading interventions at our fingertips. We have AIS programming. Um, at the middle school, we'll use the enrichment period. Um, there's a lot of great supports we put in place. And typically, even before we get to the full special education evaluation through our pupil support team, we'll work with families to put some supports in place. So if, the plan, if, if they go through the process and it's a no for special services, another plan is worked on through like partnership with the teachers or special instruction areas? We started putting some informal plans in place for students so that you know parents know um, what, what they can do at home and what we can do in the classroom. And the reading teachers have been great with working with the families and working with the classroom teachers to talk about those tier two and three interventions that are part of the general education um, spectrum that we've been using with students. You're welcome. Hey, Amy, thank you for that. Just one quick question on your slide four, that the table with the increases in IEPs. Um, two yes. things. Do you have a sense of distribution across grade levels of where though, is, is, is there a particular grade level where that's seen the greatest number of increases or is it distributed? I can get you the exact numbers. Um, it has, it's traditionally higher at the elementary school level, but we have seen an increase across um, all levels this year, even at the high school level. Um, but the greatest number has been at K and one. Amy, I also enjoyed your report. Thank you so much. I know you've worked very hard this year and I've heard wonderful things in the buildings, but um, I had a couple questions. One, uh, do you think this will level off in a year or two? I do. Um, uh, yeah. Already, even when you heard um, Mr. Furlong's reports with the budget and the increased spending in special education, when I was looking at the total IEPs in March, mm -hmm. it that number was much higher. So you'll see, um, I think it was in my, it may not have been, it may have been in my report, the declassification numbers were higher this year than they were in the past few years, right. just because we're starting to have that data yeah. that when we weren't able to declassify mm -hmm. students during remote and hybrid learning, and we're seeing big gains in kids now that they're back um, to that traditional timeline in school. I also suspect it costs some money for those on-demand 
translations and so actually that wonderful thing to have huh? actually that's that one is incredible we only pay as we use it perfect yes it's a good. wonderful service good to know thank mm -hmm. you so much you're welcome any other questions thank you very okay. much thank you so much thank you. Mm -hmm. Moving on to new business, is there a motion to approve the minutes of the regular meeting that was held on, held on May 9th? Is there a motion to approve? Thank you, Sherry. Second from Rebecca. Any discussion? All those in favor, please indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? One abstention. Three. Oop, two. Okay. Second abstention. Kelly and Dan. I just needed to check on the date that that was the one I wasn't at. Yes. <laughs> Um, item 3.02, is there a motion to approve the minutes from the May 17th Board of Education meeting? Thank you, Mark. Second from Daryl. Any discussion? All those in favor, please indicate aye. Aye. Any opposed or abstaining? Oh, my goodness. That's one of my sixth graders trying to FaceTime me. Hi. I'm in the middle of a school board meeting, but I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. So happy you teach middle school. Okay. Um, <laughs> next on, uh, we were on, I believe, 3.03. Okay. Results of the vote. Is there a motion that it be resolved that the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Manly Central School District hereby accepts the results of the May 17th, 2022 vote and election? Is there a motion? Thank you, Mark. A second. Sherry, any discussion? One quick, I did just notice as I was going back through it, there's a typo in the bus proposition wording. It says, shall the Board of Education, shall the Board of Education. Just need to strike one of those two out. Um, and obviously, great thank yous to the community for passing the budget. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? Next, we will move on to item 3.04, resolution. Is, it, is there a motion that it be resolved that the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Manlia School District hereby approve the agreements between the Fayetteville Manlia School District and the Fayetteville Free Library and the Manlia Library? Is there a motion? Thank you, Daryl. Second. Thank you, Jason. Any discussion? <clears throat> All those in favor, please indicate aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? Item 3.05. Is there a motion that the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Manly Central School District hereby sets the 2022-23 reorganization meeting for July 11th, 2022? Is there a motion? Thank you, Sherry. Is there a second? Thank you, Kelly. Uh, discussion. I know there were some folks who couldn't make this date. I did reach out to our new board members and I let everyone know that was the date that did work best for them. Um, you're going to be traveling, so there's no way to conference you in, huh? Yeah, I, I, my, my question really wasn't, yes, the 11th is a very difficult one, and I don't believe I'm going to be able to make it. And, and I know it may not be, that others may not be the best date, but I didn't hear from anybody that they couldn't do either the 13th or 14th of that week. So we can do it up to the 15th. So I sent it out to the new board members and they could do the 11th. There are vacation plans and things have been made. So, um, pardon? Uh, well, people responded to the email, but then I texted the new board members as well or incoming board members. I'm sorry. The, those of the people who replied, um, nobody mentioned the 11th. If it wasn't mentioned, did that mean you could come the 11th? Okay. Claire, what Marissa and what you had sent, you said that their preference or that the 11th worked best. I didn't hear that. No, maybe, that maybe you no, no. I, I gave them all the dates that were in the email that you sent, and, and the 11th is when they can attend. And the other dates are unavailable, out of town, whatever the case may be. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> Sorry. I, okay. I, I, I. 
the existing board didn't have any other date conflicts. I guess that's what my point is. Right, but I think, you know, to be fair, that is the date that we gave them and that's the date they plan their schedule around because, I mean, that date's been out there for a little bit with no objections from the current board, right? All those in favor, please indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? I want so be it. <laughs> um, okay. Item 3.06, proposed Board of Education 2022-23 meeting calendar. So just point out again, we have July 25th on there as a contingency meeting. Um, at the very least, we will probably use that. I would say put that on your calendar as a contingency meeting for personal actions. Um, I will get a doodle out to the board to see if we can do a retreat of some sort on that date, on that date but it definitely, if I understand, we need to use it for the uh, personnel actions. Are you, are you saying that would be an evening meeting as well? I would keep it as an evening meeting if it was just for the, um, for the personnel actions, but if we, uh, people are available for a retreat, I'm gonna put some times out there to see if we can get um, noon or, or whatever, put a couple different dates out there to see if anything works for people. If not, we'll look for a different date in this, over the summer. Okay. No worries. I want to I just, I guess, just a general vibe of the board. Of course, we always, we all want everyone to be there. But over the summer, it's extremely hard to plan for all nine of us to be in town at the same time. Um, so, but I think we sh just a quick discussion of you know the importance of having a retreat of some sort over the summer is that more important or is it more important to include nine if that means we don't end up with the retreat over the summer i think there's a lot of work that we need to look at over the summer um i think we really should try to find a time um to get nine folks together I would agree. I just like even if it means excluding me, I think there's so much to be done that if I have to be excluded because I, it happens to be the week I'm away and there isn't po any other possible date, I would be okay with the board doing the work without me and filling me in later. I'm I'm not here on the 25th. Okay. We're not together. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to think about that for a second. <laughs> Okay. All right. <clears throat> nope, I didn't do a motion on that one. It, or actually, I thought I did. Yes. Okay, well, I'll do it again. Is there a motion to approve the Board of Education 22-23 meeting calendar as presented? Is there a motion? Thank you, Daryl. Second. Thank you, uh, Mark. Any further discussion? Marissa, just, uh, I guess, a comment. So, it, and it just caught my eye. So, October other than the Monday that we're off because school is closed for the holiday, we're proposed to meet every Monday in the month of October. Is, am I reading that correctly? We put in uh, the available dates. We can, uh, the 17th would be the next two weeks later. The 24th is a contingency. So that could be a retreat that we draw a line through. The concern was if we do that, and we could move it to the 17th, all the retreats for the remainder of the year would be in the fall or the winter spring session there. So you're right, October gets busy, but we were trying to at least bring one retreat into the autumn. But it's the board's, it's the purview of the board. The third has to take place in terms of the ST3 in the middle of the audit. Right, yep. The 17th and 24th are at our discretion. The 10th is a holiday. Okay. Well, thanks for not meeting on the 10th. Appreciate that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, as no. we get closer, we can look at the 24th, that retreat date, and see if we, if we need but to. But it could be there. the 17th or 24th, the pleasure of the board, and that could be a retreat because uh, we will have held our official meeting on the 3rd for the audit and the SD3. Okay. All those in favor, please indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? Next on the agenda item, <coughs> excuse me, 3.07, 
Is there a motion that it be resolved that the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Manly Central School District hereby approves the 2022-23 Code of Conduct as presented? Is there a motion? Thank you, Kelly. Second from Jason. Any discussion? All those in favor, please indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? <coughs> Next on the agenda, item 3.08, reserve resolutions. Is there a motion that it be resolved that the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Manlius School District approve the following reserve resolutions? Is there a motion? Thank you, Mark. Second from Daryl. Any discussion? All those in favor, please indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? Item 3.09. <coughs> Is there a motion that it be resolved by the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Manly Central School District hereby approves the retention of King & King to provide architectural services for the 2022 capital transfer projects in accordance with the terms and conditions of the contract, authorizes the board, President of the Board, the Superintendent of Schools, or their designee to enter into the contract on behalf of the Board of Education and take all actions necessary or convenient to proceed under the contract in connection with the project and upon Board of Education approval, this resolution shall take effect immediately. Is there a motion? Thank you, Kelly. Second from Rebecca. Any discussion? All those in favor, please indicate aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? Next is item 3.10. Is there a motion that it be resolved that the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Manly Central School District authorizes the Board President, District Clerk, and Superintendent to sign the contract for health and welfare services provided by James Will DeWitt Central School District for the 2021-22 school year? Is there a motion? Thank you, Daryl. Second from Rebecca. Any discussion? I just have a quick question on, on each of this and the next two items. Who sets the daily reimbursement rate that we're paying to the other districts? Because there's just a wide, I don't know if Bill can answer that, but there's just a wide disparity, obviously, between these amounts. You're, you're right. There is a wide disparity. And, in fact, we held one from tonight because we're questioning because it's even higher than the remainder. Basically, there's a wide a variety of expenses that school districts can include in that calculation uh, right down to social workers. Uh, so we've seen many districts uh, increase the number of social workers and other mental health uh, professionals in school districts. So therefore, we're seeing the rates increase. Uh, what's basically behind this is, I think as you might know, um, basically when our students attend private school outside of our district boundaries, those public schools that those private schools that are within their boundaries have to provide uh, health services. And over the time, health services has really expanded as to what can be included in that number. Um, you know, some districts might be, you know, utilizing perhaps some old information, uh, but I know we do challenge districts when it um, seems to be out of line with the rest. And I know we held one tonight that will be on the uh, docket for next uh, next month's board meeting. But we do question those. Um, and it's really a very district specific thing as to what expenses they include and what they bill us for. But there is something in educational law as to what exactly they can bill us for. Uh, it also really depends too on, um, there's like an economy of scale. You know, if it's a small private school, you know, that public school might have one nurse there spread over very few students, whereas if it's a much larger uh, private school, you get an economy of scale. But uh, we do take a hard look at those, and we do challenge school districts on how they calculate it, just to make sure that they're, uh, you know, that we're putting in due diligence to make sure we're not getting overbilled. I'll bill offhand where our daily rate that we charge falls um i don't have that number right available but i can take a look at it um and and we do bill you know obviously for um you know the one school that's within our district um i can take a look at that and get that out, information out to each board member any additional questions 
All those in favor, please indicate aye. Aye. Who are opposed or abstaining? Um, item 3.11, is there a motion that it be resolved that the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Mailey Central School District authorize the superintendent to sign the contract for health and welfare services provided by the Oneida City School District for the 2021-22 school year? Is there a motion? Thank you, Sherry. And a second from Mark. Any discussion? All those in favor, please indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? Item 3.12, is there a motion that it be resolved that the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Mailey Central School District authorize the Board President, District Clerk, and Superintendent to sign the contract for health and welfare services provided by the Syracuse City School District for the 2021-22 school year? Is there a motion? <coughs> Thank you, Jason. A second from Sherry. Any discussion? All those in favor, please indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? Item 3.13, is there a motion that it be resolved that the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Manley Central School District hereby approves the bus bond resolution as presented? Is there a motion? Thank you, Kelly. And a second from Jason. Any discussion? All those in favor, please indicate aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? Moving on to board development, board leadership positions. If anyone's interested in a board leadership position, please inform the rest of the board. Um, we like it here, though. Just so you know, we, we like it here. <laughs> <laughs> we do like it. We like it. Just so you know. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> um, next, uh, Nisba Convention in Syracuse, and we're lucky we don't need hotels because apparently that is the weekend of the Notre Dame versus SU game, and. It's going to be crazy. So we just we do have to get our registration in. Um, it opens September. I'm sorry, August 1st. So anyone planning to attend, if you've never gone to the convention, this is a great opportunity since it's right here in our back door, literally. And, and Dr. Coughlin, we received good news regarding one of our musical groups. That is fantastic. Oh my gosh. So uh, during the opening ceremony, they, they have student performances and it's groups from wherever it is. And so this will be our first time say, well, I don't know, they used to have the convention here back in the 90s, I guess. I don't know what happened back then, but to have our kids on the stage to perform. So now we're all going to the convention on that day. So <laughs> just put, your, put on your calendars. Uh, thank you, Mary, and thank you, Carlos, for making that happen. Uh, okay, let's see, working agenda items. All right, so, <clears throat> excuse me, we do need to circle back at some point to talk about the veterans tax exemption, um, transition to electric buses, Senate Bill um, S-151, and then our updates from students related to mental health. I would like us to also add to that um, further discussion about uh, religious holidays that we've had a, heard from a lot of folks this evening. You know, I have a lot of Muslim students and whether they're like stu people who've just come here from Africa or the Middle East or, or people who live here, like, their holidays are as important. I mean, it's like Eid is like Christmas, like yes. not literally, but the excitement that the kids have for it. So, and that's the yeah, so, but I mean, just as a, as we a district dis though. Oh, sorry, as we discovered the, the, and I don't know if it's changed since I checked a month ago, but um, the, the Senate bill and the House, the matching House bill has a line in there that says based on population to a, of a school district, which um, we can't ask, yeah, or Dr. Tice, you've told me, we can't ask. We, so, yeah, we, we can no longer ask that question. I know we had a gentleman <clears throat> last year reach out to us after there were student presentations and we asked him informally to have folks send emails to me or through the Let's Talk portal. I think the important thing to remember is that the original holidays were set up because so many students and staff were missing and had nothing to do with the importance of the holiday, the fact that it was religious. And I think as we move towards that, uh, we're going to have to consider uh, the Senate and the Assembly bill but we, again, we have to remember we have to fit 180 days in mm -hmm. between Labor Day and Rating Day, uh, Regents Week at the end of June. And there's only so many days 
And uh, the question becomes not just the Eids, but Diwali and a lot of other holidays that could be brought forward just as important. So then I think what will be before the board is the cannibalization of a February or April break in trade-off to get the 180 days. I know we creatively yeah. talked about, you know, some folks in their place of employment get vacation days. Is there a way to do, you know, religious holidays that, P, that we would be open? We would certainly have to negotiate with the teachers and all the other bargaining units, but are we open every day and then not scheduling exams or new instruction, but review sessions or whatever, and then people take the religious holidays as they see fit. But it's important to remember that the, the Jewish and the Christian holidays were taken because this district would lose most of the people attending in recognition. So the question becomes a, not a quality issue, but a quantity issue. And I certainly hear the folks that were here tonight and the importance and is there a way to navigate that? Is, do we give the entire day, no matter what the size of the population? But I think there's going to be other religions, religions coming forward asking for their holiday so recognized. So I think we just have to be prepared. You know, we look for the win-win in many cases, but I think what does the future hold to get those 180 days in? So that's a great question. So actually the, the point I wanted to make uh, but it, it, like, thank you for that explanation. Um, use, waiting for the Senate or the assembly bills to be passed, actually from what I discovered when I was looking into it, um, doesn't really help us because it would then be shifted back to us based on population, which is something we can't, we can't ask about. So unless the wording changes, which it has already changed, um, it, I mean, it's, it, it already changed to include this, um, the, the assembly bills as written and the Senate bills as written do not say the whole state will have these days off. They currently say you take these off if your population needs it. Well, that's what I want to circle back to. If we can't ask and the bill says it's based on data, then how are we going? I mean, because yeah. I think that's not what it says exactly. Not, does, does it currently that, says where um, school districts or the Board of Education have a considerable proportion of students to observe such days, okay. and it includes Diwali and Onam as well as the Eid holidays. So I think it gives a lot of discretion to the district and the board to determine what that means with the understanding that we can't directly solicit that information, but we should also acknowledge that our population has changed, yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. including the Jewish community. I, I things The population has shifted since those policies yeah. were put in place, so I think we have to continue to talk about this. Mm -hmm. I think we can still also be advocates for this bill, which is currently in the Education Committee. Um, but we have circled back around on this and the decision making I think this year was, we d determined it was too short notice for us to be able to make those changes um, along with the other considerations. But I think we should need to keep moving this conversation forward with and as the Education Committee potentially moves forward in the yeah. Senate and the Assembly. And I think you probably said it more clearly than I w was saying it, but that's kind of what I'm saying is that we can't wait for this. We have to have the discussion ourselves. And we have to make a decision early enough in the year. We shouldn't be making this decision, um, you know, right a few weeks before the holiday takes place. So um, I think thinking about this at um, summer retreat, get information for then and so that we have a decision early in the school year. Yeah. And that we also can think about how we're gonna make this decision uh, when we have to look at other religious holidays or, or from other, um, from other um, religious groups. So we do need to make sure we have a fair process that we're, and how we're making those decisions, as Dr. Tice says, um, some objective way of doing it. But I do think we need to get it done sooner than rather than later. So um, we can look at having that on the upcoming um, agenda and getting some information to the board so we can discuss that further along with these other items that we need to oh, um, add. I'm sorry, I heard like a... No, I'm sorry, Marissa, just along those lines, if we're going to get more information and talk about it further, I just would really want information for, I guess, the opinions of our bargaining units um, just presented to us in terms of where they fall in line with it. Um, I understand that the board obviously sets the calendar for the year, but I, w I would love to get their input because, you know, taking away a February break or an April break, um, you know, have been staples for a very long time. So I, I just would like to get information from them to see where they line up. 
And to be clear to Tice, that's not a that's not a given that we would have to take away a February break or a, a an April break. I was I was asking you a question about that. Um, I just uh, prior brought to the those meeting. up as examples of the opportunity costs. I need 180 days, so we, right. can, we can go on weekends. No, well, <laughs> you know, I'm teasing, but it's tough to look for the win-win on that. But it doesn't. You're right. It doesn't have to be February, April, but it does have to be 180 days. Are we still so. allowed to use um, online days for like snow days? If we have a snow day, are we still allowed to use. The good news is uh, for next year, correct? It's been modified that we do not have to provide private school transportation on the day the public school is closed. So one of the, uh, the fly in the ointment uh, for this past year was that if we closed because of inclement weather in or, and then it's shifted to an online day, we had to provide private school transportation. So that has been taken off the table. I'm sure there are lobbyists for the private schools will push back on that. But that means, yes, maybe it's the snow days that give, or the emergency closing days, I should say, and that we immediately go to online instruction. So the, right now, we go to online instruction when the emergency closing days are exhausted. So maybe in the future, uh, with these additional religious holidays, uh, we move to online instruction on the first inclement weather day because we no longer have to provide private school transportation. It's a lot of factors to consider, and I think you know, before the board meeting, we can make sure we have all those. And if board members have questions, um, we definitely will give people enough time to get those in so those questions can be answered before we have a discussion about it. Did you have something, Dan? Yeah, I, I see just a, a couple of things on this. So the legislation that's pending, and obviously this can change at any time, and language can change, but, but and I haven't backtracked each section that's being amended by this, but what it currently says, to, in relation, I think it's in relation to 180 days, is that these observed holidays would be cal calculated as session days, and that they, it's not with, it doesn't affect the calculation. So that's at least what's in the draft, but at least also as it's drafted, we know it's not gonna happen for next school year unless they change it because it's set to go into effect on the July 1st following the date on which it becomes a law. And that's, unless it happens in the next 17 days, that's not going to happen. Um, so we, we do have to have the local discussion, but I think that there's two versions of the local discussion. If we bridge the gap, you know, one bridge the gap discussion that we can and should have as we heard tonight is the pressures of what am I missing in school and what's due and what do I have to make up? And we can have discussions and perhaps should have discussions about perhaps we don't assign homework on that day. Perhaps we don't have tests or assignments due the following day so that they don't have to spend a holiday doing schoolwork or worrying about schoolwork that's due the following day. So there are, there are interim steps if we can't, if, we, if where we land is that school is still in session that day, there are interim steps that we can take to make this easier for those students and not as disruptive for them on their holiday. And I think these are... Thank you very much. Um, we just ask that the people who are present just um, speak during public comment, but I do appreciate you, you making sure that people understand how wonderful our teachers have been. So that's always nice. And I understand, I appreciate your, I understand you're very um, passionate about this subject. So no, no, no problem, no problem. A lot of people didn't know that, but thank you very much for clarifying that. We so, appreciate it. So I do think just as a matter of policy, because we do not have a policy relating that, so that may be an interim step that we can take a look at as we discuss this work. Right, that's another thing to consider. I recall we spoke about that at a um, previous meeting. So we will gather all this information together and um, so we can have a discussion and see what we could do or would like to do in regards to those additional religious holidays. Um, let's see here. So, so just back to where we were, because we mm -hmm. were on, um, working agenda items. We, mm -hmm. we have had discussions before about having um, discussion going forward about v whatever the form may take about homework policy 
I thought this was on here before. It seems to have fallen off of both this and the following agenda items. Um, so I, I would appreciate if we could add that and, and find time to schedule some discussions in that direction. Okay. And the other one that I thought we talked about at the last meeting that I was at was that we would, you know, certainly we've heard about it and we've heard about it and heard about it is whether we have a board discussion about grading policy. Mm -hmm. I think we can tie those together. All right, thank you. What is the updates from students item? Do you that was in regards to um, the mental health um, issues and that students presented to us and so seeking out additional information from students. Um, as Craig mentioned earlier, the possibility of survey, touching base with students. So just making sure that we're continuing to reach out and get information from our students. Um, Hannah, I, I mean, with Hannah here and leaving, do you have any thoughts about how we can con continue to hear from the student body beyond the seniors that are leaving? Um, I would, if it would ever be possible to like almost hold some type of um, like after school forum where students who were wanting to speak on the issue had the ability to, whether it was just with <clears throat> administrators at the high school that got brought back to the Board of Ed or even um, a way for them to like send emails directly. I know that is an option, but I don't think students know that as much as uh, parents or community members know, where if they wanna get in contact with their issues regarding mental health to the board, they could do it, yes, email that way. Those are great suggestions. I mean, maybe we wanna think about what outreach there is directly to the student body from us to them. Um, I mean, not whatever we, we can, can can discuss what makes the most sense, just to know that that is another, that we are here for them as well, and we, they can reach us directly. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, Rebecca. Okay, moving on to potential considerations for future meetings. So we've kind of discussed a few of those in the previous item that we will add to meet you future meeting agendas, and then we've got our future meetings, a calendar, we've got graduation coming up. It's, oh, that's a date to remember though. Um, so I'll skip the dates to remember. Um, we are back at OCC for graduation. Please make sure they're by 545. And the athletics award ceremony is on the 14th. All right, um, item 6.01, a proposed executive session. <clears throat> Excuse me. Is there a motion that it be resolved that the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Manly Essential School District enter into an executive session to discuss the employment history of a particular individual? Thank you, Rebecca. Second from Sherry in discussion. All those in favor, please indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? So we are going to go into executive session for the audience and we're gonna come back into public session and uh, see here, consent agenda approval and then we'll have another executive session after that. So there's not a lot more that we'll be doing, but we will be back in public session shortly. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So we will move to item seven, the consent agenda. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Thank you, Kelly. Second from Mark. All those in favor, please indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? Okay, so now we are down to item, <coughs> excuse me, nine, uh, our second executive session. <coughs> so we have three matters for the executive session. Um, one is the superintendent's year in evaluation. The second one is, pardon me, related to a oh, matters that will imperil the public safety if disclosed. 
And then the other one would be a student matter. Is there a motion to enter into executive session? <clears throat> Thank you, Jason. Second. Thank you, Mark. Any discussion? All those in favor, please indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstain? All right, so we're going to go into executive session and we will adjourn from there. No further public business. Thank you.